Uh, if you haven't heard of Intuit, just a little brief introduction about us. Uh, you may know TurboTax, MailChimp, um, but uh, we run services on Kubernetes modern SaaS and we're moving billions of dollars through our systems as well as uh, uh, billions of machine predictions and such things uh, every day. Amongst the five platforms at Intuit that we have as teams, Amin and myself are from the development of uh, productivity and experiences platform. And here numbers, you can see the scale of what we attend to on a daily basis for our engineers and Intuit. And finally, um, Intuit's big in the open source community. Uh, we just rec we received the end user award uh, in 2019, and you may have noticed in the keynote, we got it again this year. Uh, we're also very involved with uh, many projects as contributors, as well as maintainers, and these are just some of them out there. And quick agenda. So we're gonna go over a little bit about our history, what our landscape looks like at Intuit, discuss a little bit about the problem, and then we'll go over a solution, show you a demo, and do a Q&A. So with that, we'll go ahead and get started. Intuit's been on this journey for quite a while. Uh, back in about 2013, uh, we got All right, cool. Sorry. Um, so yeah, okay. We um, we started very narrow. We declared we're going to be all in the cloud. So we were getting out of data centers at that time, um, and we started with just a few applications, few of our services, and. Once we had success with those, we decided about, let's say 2017 or so, dates or years are a little hazy at times, um, we shifted the scale. So we, we, we had such good success, we were like, we're gonna push everyone now, let's all go into the cloud. So there's much broader adoption within the company. So engineers were creating all kinds of cloud resources, AWS accounts, what, whatever they needed to do, they were pretty free to, to meet the needs of their services and applications. Um, and then we just stumbled into the kind of, I think a problem many of you may have had working at larger companies and you end up with a large EC2 fleet and that gets to be pain, a bit painful to manage, which about I think 2018 to around there led us to containers which obviously led us to Kubernetes and, and scaling up on that. So all our services are pretty much in Kubernetes on containers now. We don't really run as much in EC2 anymore. And that was a modernization of our services. Now we've had great success with that. Uh, we were still left with a lot of stuff in AWS, to, for lack of a better word. So we've been going down this path of modernization of that while applying similar principles that we did with our services. But in order to get there, we had to take a look at our landscape. Uh, if you deploy anything in AWS, you know you just don't deploy one or two little things necessarily. You're gonna end up with IAM roles or whatever other supporting types of resources. So for a lot of our services, they had to have um, RDS, SQS, buckets, things like that, all the kinds of persistence and messaging uh, you would need to do the job. So we categorize that as supporting resources. Then we had some things we were using, cloud resources that weren't really container-based. Uh, these would be like SageMaker or Amazon Connect or something like that um, without, couldn't put those in the containers, so we just had to kind of figure out how to deal with those. And finally, we still had some what we would consider legacy, not necessarily legacy from the perspective of the technologies, but legacy to us because we couldn't move these into containers necessarily. And we weren't ready to, we aren't ready to just completely turn them off or, or do something else with them at this point. So with that in mind, what, what was the problem we were seeing out there? 
Well, first, um, we found a lot of engineers were making various types of solutions for themselves, which is gonna happen in a heavy engineering org. Uh, in this first column, you know, we're looking at, it's the orchestration column, if you will. Uh, it's custom automation, so from soup to nuts, doing everything they can possibly do to uh, manage their, their cloud resource. And then it would get down to just doing something in Jenkins. Uh, I just wrote a little script and just pop it into that whole workflow, uh, good enough. And then you've even got, as well, the manual people. This would be laptops, my bash script, maybe someone goes in council and does some random things they needed to do, or just deploying even a CloudFormation stack from there. And once we found that, we looked at what was it they were using? Well, on the whole, CloudFormation a lot. Uh, we had some use of com uh, Cloud Development Kit, and we also had use of Terraform as well. So, and it could be cross these different orchestrations. They could be using CloudFormation and Cloud Development Kit, or CloudFormation and Terraform even as well. So lots of different solutions using lots of different infrastructure as code amongst our engineers. And they've traditionally had a lot of freedom to pick these different things that into it to uh, service their abilities. So it felt a bit like this. We were chasing a lot of wires, looking where they connected, who was connected to what, uh, finding out where, where it all went. So we stepped back, said, we need to come up with a few principles here. Otherwise, whatever solve we come up with is not gonna be able to solve everything or at least give the engineers enough of a platform to, to do their business. First thing was to align with our existing standards. They may be internal standards, industry standards, but whatever those were, we need to make sure we were within guidelines of those. If we are gonna develop anything, it should be as open source where possible, as you saw in the uh, Initial slides, uh, we are very open source friendly now, so we want to continue with that path as well. Finally, whatever we did, we had to be cloud agnostic. Um, you don't know what's gonna happen one, two, three years. Do you stay on AWS? Do you use something else or whatever? So we didn't wanna put ourselves in that position where we couldn't move. And infrastructure as code with GitOps. Uh, traditionally, a lot of people, Little git ops -y they use Git, but they're pretty much just running a little orchestration engine half the time, or they're just running a script or something. So we want to bring that git ops experience to that infrastructure as code as well. And isolation from the cloud environment, meaning we didn't want anybody touching it with their manual laptop or going directly to their uh, account, uh, cloud accounts with Jenkins or something like that. So we realized some things were missing. Um, we could certainly align with existing standards and we could already isolate from the cloud environment in multiple ways. Uh, but we didn't have anything that open source really met the needs of the engineers being able to pick whatever they wanted. Whatever we were currently doing was definitely not cloud agnostic. And then um, they weren't using infrastructure as code with GitOps. Um, that was sometimes it just foreign for them. So this led us to need to create our own service. So we'd like to introduce our service called Cello. And what is Cello? It is a engine for cloud deployments. It lets us run infrastructure as code with GitOps. It gives us that isolation from the cloud environment and it is open source. Um, and with that, we are gonna run through a little demo. So I would like to hand off to my co-presenter Amin. Uh, thank you. Um, so before that, before we actually get into the demo, first I want to talk a little bit more about um, where Cello fits into our overall ecosystem from a developer perspective. So first, we are going to walk through a brief uh, hypothetical scenario for a developer that wants to work on a new project. Let's say I'm a developer and I want to make a new Lambda project at Intuit or something. So the process from, from my perspective would be I'm gonna come to some internal developer portal. This doesn't have to be like anything fancy or anything. Um, we just need some UI so we can ask some questions like, uh, what, what type of thing are you working on? What AWS account do you want to deploy to? The, the kind of questions you need to know when starting up a new project. 
Um, so we take that information, we end up sending it to an orchestration layer. The details of that orchestration layer don't matter, but essentially we need to talk to a bunch of different systems because we need to set up infrastructure for our users, right? Because when I make a new project, I need a place to store my code. I need a way to deploy it, and I need that nice integration so that I have continuous integration and deployment. So the first thing that orchestration layer will call is GitHub. We need to start with our code. So we'll make a couple repositories for our project. Um, for the sake of consistency with our services, we end up making a application code repo where we'll store our infrastructure's code, as well as a deployment repo where we store our manifests. I'll get into some of the more specific details about what I mean by manifests when we get to the actual demo part, but we basically, in a similar way to Kubernetes manifests, we have shallow manifests. So once I have my GitHub repositories, then we end up talking to Cello. I have this, I have these repositories where I'm gonna be doing some cloud infrastructure, I'm gonna be writing cloud infrastructure code. I need a way to deploy it. So we end up calling Cello and telling it, we've got this new project going on. We've got, we're gonna be deploying things out of this repository. Cello will do some work, allow, give us the necessary things we need in order to do those deployments, and it'll give us back a nice uh, Cello project token. Um, these, that token will allow us to essentially make calls to Cello so that we can deploy specifically for this particular project. So we'll take that token and then we'll use that token to talk to Jenkins. Jenkins is our CI, CD platform that we use at Intuit. Um, you, this doesn't necessarily have to be Jenkins. This could be any CI platform. It could be GitHub Actions, uh, Travis, whatever. As long as you have the ability to store secrets, really. Um, it could be anything. Um, so we will end up creating a new Jenkins job for our project associated with that GitHub repo that we made earlier and store that Cello project token so that that way our Jenkins job will be able to uh, call Cello when it needs to. And so we'll make all these different pieces of infrastructure and then we'll go back to the user, either we'll like send them an email or like give them a, note, like a, a message on the UI or something. I'll we'll say, hey, we made all this infrastructure for you. You can, you, you're, you should get started on coding or whatever. Cool. But what does that look like for the actual developer on a day-to-day -day experience? So, the, the the process for actually developing code and actually writing your cloud resources ends up looking a little bit like this. So first things first, I'm a developer working on my project. I'll write up some code. I'll make a PR, get my teammates to approve it, and I'll get the code merged into master. So the moment that code gets into our master or main, whatever your default branch is. Um, so the moment that code gets into our default branch, we're going to kick off a Jen we're going to kick off a Jenkins build. So immediately, we'll go through, we'll start our CI pipeline, and it'll do all the things you would normally expect. Let's build our let's build our infrastructure as code. Make sure it passes all our tests. Make sure it passes any like security checks or linting rules, anything like that. And then once we've made sure all our code looks good, we'll package it up. And then now is the part where we get back to our actual deployment process. We, wanna, we know our code is good. We know it's all ready to go. So now we're going to deploy it to our various accounts. So this is where Jenkins will actually use that token we talked about earlier. It'll take that token from, or take that token and then use it to call the channel APIs and tell it, hey, I need to do some operations. I need to do some stuff. Uh, I need to see the difference between what I previously had in my AWS account, for example, and what's now, and what's now there. So Jenkins will end up calling Cello. Cello will perform this operation, and it will end up streaming the, the logs for the operation back to Jenkins so that the user can, can see, oh, cool. If I go through with this, I will be adding this new Lambda, or I'll be making a new SQS uh, queue or whatever. And then this will, and then once, it, once they see that, they might say, yeah, I want to actually deploy that right now. Press an approve button. And then same thing, Jenkins will end up calling Cello. Cello will go through the deployment process, kick off that, kick off that build, whatever infrastructure as code process that is, whether it be like Terraform apply or CDK deploy or just whatever cloud formation or like whatever thing it needs to do to, depending on the infrastructure as code language they use. It's going to use that, it's going to make, run those commands and stream those logs back to Jenkins, and the developer will be able to see, oh cool, my, my, my resources are deploying, awesome. And so you, through that whole process, the developer within 
as little as potentially five minutes, depending on how complicated their infrastructure is, they'll go from, I merged a PR and I got my code in, into my default branch, to, oh, my resources are all deployed and ready to go and I can actually start testing against it. I can actually start making API calls or to my Lambda or whatever, whatever they end up needing to do. So that's, a, so that's, what the ends of, that's what, how all of this kind of fits together. So now I will get a little bit more into uh, Cello itself. So we have a brief demo kind of showing what Cello, what Cello is, how it actually works under the, the hood, basically walking through um, the process of what it, it's not gonna actually, oh, it's a slightly different, oh, it's a slightly different screen size, I guess. Uh, that's fine. <laughs> it's not actually, Okay, whatever. Um, so we're basically going to walk through this quick demo. I have it pre-recorded just because I didn't want to worry about like network connectivity or anything like that. But essentially, this is what I would be running on my computer. Um, so for for a little bit of context here, the idea here is we have a sample CDK application. Um, you, you don't need to know necessarily CDK in particular. Um, this could be any infra infrastructure as code language. The thing you really need to know is I write some TypeScript code it makes a queue and a topic, and we want to get that into our AWS account. And so I have Cello running locally in this terminal right below this code. And so what we're going to be, do it, be doing here is we're kind of going to walk through the API calls that would be happening if I want to actually see how I could diff and deploy this code to some sample AWS account I had. So now we are going to skip forward a tiny bit. All right, so the first thing that would happen is we need to create a project in Cello. So going back to some of those principles we were talking about of separating out our, isolating our environments, grouping, making sure we follow infrastructure as code as a main principle, we want to create a, we want to create this nice little project. That way you can say, we've got this project here. It will be deploying out of this repository and anything I do, any operations I do related to this repository, we're going to basically be using, we're going to be deploying by reading some information from that repository and deploying to it. Um, in this case, we happen to be using the Cello project because we have some example, um, example infrastructure and manifests in that repository, but this could be whatever your repository you want to use. It's just a matter of coincidence that happens to also be the Cello project repo. So we would end up, I'm gonna skip ahead a tiny bit. Um, so I keep talking about these manifests, so I'll talk a little bit more about that. Um, so essentially, kind of like how in Kubernetes you have the idea of a manifest kind of describing, oh, these are types of things we need to deploy. We have this idea of cello manifests. So like, if I have a couple of different environments and I have a couple of different things I need to deploy and I want to deploy them a certain way, we have a couple of different manifests to say, oh, we have, this, we have this CDK application, it's gonna be, we're gonna be using CDK, we have a couple args we need to pass whenever we do this deployment, some environment variables, we have, we wanna use this particular project, we need to do, we wanna do these types of operations. So we'll declare, we'll declare this manifest that has that information. And so these manifests will live in that deployment repo that I was talking about earlier. And so we'll, we'll have that set up We'll call our create project API, and now we'll get back this uh, Cello project token. So this is the token I was talking about back in that initial onboarding uh, overview I was, I was talking about. And essentially, the idea behind this token is we want to have a token specific to this particular project because we want to make sure, um, if I'm doing the operations, I'm really only doing operations uh, specific to my particular project, my particular uh, application, so we make a so we'll make a, a token and we'll end up just saving it somewhere so that later when we actually call some of our other APIs later, we will actually be able to uh, use it for this project. So that we'll end up saving that. Let me go forward a bit. So we end up saving that away. And then, so next step is we end up creating a target. So the idea behind targets is you might have a couple different uh, places you want to deploy to. Maybe you have like a pre-prod environment and like a production environment, or like maybe you have different environments or whatever. And going back to the idea of that separation of concerns, we wanna make sure we use as little permissions as possible when we do different operations. 
So the idea here is we will create a target specific to each uh, thing we want to deploy to so that when I do a deployment using my QAL target or something, I only have the permissions I really need to do that. So in this case, uh, we, will, we are creating a target here um, and we actually say, we want to scope it down to this specific AWS role or we want to use these specific permissions. And so we end up creating that target. Um, the names for these uh, projects and targets are just kind of sample ones. Um, you could name them whatever you really wanted to. Probably something more useful to like how you want to actually, you'd probably name it something like the name of your environment or the name of your account or something like that. So anyway, we, make the, we end up making this target. And so now we've done these initial precepts that we do as a one-time operation. Now that we've done that, we can actually get to the actual, um, the actual like main operations we want to do. So the idea here is we're gonna take that, uh, that cello token we decided earlier, and we end up using that as, um, as our authorization so we can call our main operations API. And so the idea here is we, we want to do an operation, we know what project we want to, what project we're using, we know what target we want to deploy to, and we'll tell it, hey, we, have, we, want to, we want to make a new deployment. We have this manifest here at this in our GitHub repo. Here's the SHA that we will actually want to deploy. And so, it will, and so we, will call this opera, we will call this operations API, and Cello will do the process of looking up that manifest and actually kicking off an operation. So what do I mean by operation? Well, op an operation essentially kicks off an Argo workflow. And the idea of what's happening here is based on the configuration that we had in that manifest, we're gonna kick off a new workflow and we're going to actually do whatever that workflow, whatever that manifest tells us to do. So in this case, um, this API call is actually kicking off a, a CDK diff, which is essentially telling us, is essentially how CDK lets us see, oh, here's what you previously had and here's what you, here's what you, your changes would do into your account. So we send that API call over and we get back a workflow name, basically just the name of the workflow that got kicked off by Cello. And so now once we have that workflow name, we can actually see uh, some of the different details about, uh, about the status of that workflow. So we can actually see things like the, we can see like the status of that workflow. We can see did it succeed or not. We can see, uh, we can see the, yes, yeah, so we have an API to get the status of that workflow. And we can see things like the logs if we wanted to. Um, so you can see this one already succeeded and we can actually get details for the logs. Um, and these logs will kind of show us what's happening. We can actually see, oh, we, we use that Cello token to talk to Vault and get some, get some, uh, get a temporary AWS credential. We can actually see it pulled down our CDK code. And we can see, oh, we did some bootstrapping and then there is a giant stack of uh, text at the bottom saying, oh, these are the resources you, these are the resources we're adding or deleting or whatever. Um, this would obviously look different depending on what infrastructure's code language you're using and what exactly you're trying to deploy, but that's essentially the main idea. Um, this, you, in practice, you probably wouldn't use, uh, you would probably wouldn't want to read it like this. You probably would want to use, we have a streaming API for the logs also, so that if you want to just like see it directly in Jenkins or like, a CNCI or like something like that, you could use that also. Depends on what you're ultimately trying to do. But that's essentially the main idea. We want, by using, by using Cello, we are able to create the project and targets for our uh, specific, for our specific use cases. And then when we want to do new things, like make, a new, make new code changes, we end up performing these operations and, and we can actually see how, the, how those operations are going. So that's essentially the idea there. Um, that's it for the demo. So now I'll go back to the presentation. All right. So that was so that was so that was our that was our that was our deep dive into Cello. Now I'm going to talk a little bit about how we've been using Cello at Intuit. So internally, we've been using Cello for um, essentially the past year, and in that time, we've been getting a lot of adoption internally. We've, been, we've created over a thousand projects using Cello for various cloud deployments, as well as 150 of those, more than 150 of those projects deploying cloud resources all the way up to production. So we've been getting a lot, we've been getting a lot of internal usage, but we still have more things we want to do with this. 
So now I'm going to talk a little bit about what's next. So there are a couple of key features we want to work on, uh, one of them being uh, a better credential provider extraction. Um, so one of the things I briefly, uh, I very vaguely mentioned but didn't go into too much detail about was how do we do that credential exchange between various cloud, uh, cloud accounts. Um, right now we are using uh, Vault. Um, if you haven't heard about it, it is another open source uh, project. I'm not gonna get too much into details of it, but we want to make a better abstraction for that so we can swap out different credentials providers as needed. Um, we, another feature we want to work on is more multi-cloud support. So one of the things we really focused on was when we were like designing our principles was we want to be able to support multiple clouds. Um, that being said, at, internally at Intuit, the one we obviously have a grand majority of our things on AWS, so we want to do more to actually support other, uh, other cloud providers like GCP, Azure, whatever. So that's something we want to improve on further. And then finally, prudential things like, oh, it's great that we have, it's great that we have these APIs that allow us to do these operations, but it would be nice if we could make that process a little easier because not everyone wants to use APIs for everything, right? So one of the things we were, we were thinking about for eventual, for eventual plans would be like having a nice user interface that people could just press a button kind of like in the way like Argo does to like roll back this operation or like deploy our things, those kinds of things. So those are some of the features uh, that we were planning on working on next. And now I'm gonna pass it back over to Jerome to talk a little bit about uh, wrapping up. So yeah, so thank you, Amin. Um, yeah, we'd love for you to come out, try Cello out, give us feedback. Uh, we have a great quick start, I think. Uh, you could set up fairly quick, less than a few minutes. It'll have Vault, it'll have all the things it needs, and you can try it out with an AWS account. To get we have examples in the repo, and we have uh, all our documentation up there as well to help you along. With that, uh, thank you everyone. We're open for questions now. Go ahead. Oh, he's coming. Uh, thank you very much for presentation. Question, uh, what brought you to the conclusion that you need to develop this tool? Why don't just put light inside the Jenkins pipeline and it, it should work perfectly? Right, so our, our engineers, we have about 6,000 engineers and traditionally they have always picked their own ISC or their own deployment mechanisms. So in order to support them widely, uh, we didn't want to push them down one homogenous solution because that has not traditionally worked for us. So we went with a more open solution which allowed also uh, easier path to migration for those, for our engineers. Uh, first, thank you for the talking. It's very nice. Uh, my question is: uh, uh, In the talking, you create the token for Trello's Trello project for each project. How do you manage the token? Like the rotate the token? Do you have automation in place uh, in Trello? Uh, yeah, sure. Okay. Um, yeah. So um, we do have a couple APIs in place for um, the token rotation process. Um, so these project tokens are medium long-lived tokens. They're like, I think they expire automatically in a year by default. Um, but we have a couple APIs in place. Um, this kind of goes back to that thing we were talking about, about uh, credential provider abstraction. But in the case of Vault, that means we, ha we, will, we, will, we have an, API an ability to clear out and revoke those tokens or make new ones uh, using some APIs if we need to. And just one follow-up on that is that when we use it, we're not using long-lived uh, long secrets in the AWS accounts themselves. We're actually getting temporary credentials when we, we actually do a deployment action. So that, that token is just for cello, cello use with the uh, internal. Yeah. Yeah. Um, can, oh, gosh, sorry. <laughs> uh, quick question would be, so you mentioned how different teams have you know, kind of choose their own adventure, so to speak, as far as their um, tooling. I see we, I think the API makes sense as far as like the, um, the spec, but I'm just kind of curious maybe for 
the developer experience? Like, do they, do you guys provide, uh, pro because there's a lot of different API calls you have to probably manually call in like Postman and stuff like that. Could you give a little bit more insight if of the experience of an Intuit developer team having to, you know, when they leverage the API, how that generally looks and maybe some metrics like how long it takes for them to onboard with it and all of those kind of things. Sure. Um, I, I think you got one thing to say at least too. All right. <laughs> so they don't directly interact with the API. We, we, give them tooling around that within Jenkins, and we have a onboarding UI that Amin was showing you the, uh, the UML for. Um, they mostly interact with GitHub and the code they need to uh, create their resources or their application code. So typically they don't have to see that at all. Uh, that's mostly our world. <laughs> mm -hmm. Anything you wanna add? Yeah, we, we try our best to abstract a lot of the, like, the more uh, nitty gritty parts away from our developers as much as possible. So in practice, a developer doesn't even necessarily need to know that we're using Cello under a hood for this. The idea here is mainly we give them the tools to allow them to do their deployments. And as far as they're aware, they have a Jenkins pipeline. They can see how, what it's doing. So they can see that like, oh, this Jenkins pipeline is making API calls to something called Cello. Whether, how much they know, how much they know or care about Cello is up to them at the end of the day. That's really all I had to add to that. Any other questions? Oh, I've got one. Um, so just making sure I understand that Cello is abstracting itself as a layer outside of any of the CDK, CFN, or um, I like Terraform, is that correct? Yeah. Yep. Yep. So who is in charge of writing like Say, say for instance, you, first question, you mentioned it was cloud agnostic, so would I assume that it doesn't matter what environment I'm creating it for, um, AWS, GCP, Azure, Cello is intuitive enough to create whatever environment I'm asking for? Gotcha. Um, so essentially you're just asking, um, it do, oh, you're just asking about, um, does it matter which cloud uh, pro provider you're actually using at the end of the day? Precisely. Uh, so, one, our long-term plan is to try and support all these different cloud providers. Um, that being said, we need to build out the uh, adapter layers for those different providers. Okay. Um, so right now, the one we have in place is AWS. Um, we want to build out more as we go. Um, but right now, that, is, that part is a little bit specific to the Cello implementation, if that makes sense. Sort of. Yeah, I can follow up after. It's fine. Okay. Well, thank you guys so much for attending and thank you for the session. We can right. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.